So our next speaker is Dr. David Murphy, who's going to talk about shifting gears a little bit now to um, unibase safety programs and patient safety, and we, have, we think about that in critical care now. David? So thanks, and, and thanks for having me. And one of the, the things that I've, I've noticed in going through the program, listening through some of these talks, is, is the necessity for teamwork. Right. Um, you may have liver failure, but there's a whole lot of other things going wrong. How do we work effectively together as a team to identify how to take care of our patients? A sepsis patient, how do we identify them in the emergency room or on the floor? How do we then transition them effectively to an ICU, resuscitate, manage them, get them out, get them home? How do we do that? My grandma, I'd like to start with a, a couple cases. This is a little girl. Her name is Josie King. Uh, Josie uh, and her family moved into a new house in Maryland uh, in 2003. Unfortunately, it had an outdated water heater, and she suffered first and second degree burns. She was transferred to Johns Hopkins, where they treated her burns effectively. They got her out of the PICU to step down. Unfortunately, a series of events happened, which were picked up by her mother, Sorel King, who speaks nationally and internationally regarding patient safety and patient safety culture. Well, Sorel identified these things and said, there's something wrong with Josie, but sometimes the nurses, some of the nurses picked up on this and listened to her. Some didn't. And some of the interns did, and some didn't. And by the time it got to the resident, the fellow, and the attending, everything was just fine with Josie, except everything wasn't just fine with Josie. We ineffectively communicated as a team. It was a game of telephone gone wrong. And unfortunately, Josie developed perhaps dehydration, perhaps a central line associated with a bloodstream infection, perhaps C. diff. But she coded was effectively resuscitated, and unfortunately coded again that next, uh, later that day, was transferred back to the PICU and was subsequently taken off the ventilator and died in her mother's arms. This is not the story that Sorel King wanted to share, not the story that Johns Hopkins wanted to share, but it was the story that they had to share. And it's a story that they've learned from. And in fact, many of our hospitals across the country, and in fact, the world, have been learning from. Healthcare is a story of wins and losses. Here's a, another patient. Um, on, the, on the left side, there's a whole lot of white there, right? So uh, this is a patient who had interstitial lung disease. He was in his 60s. Um, and developed an acute on chronic respiratory failure, was um, required mechanical ventilation in the medical ICU uh, for a couple days prior to then undergoing successful lung transplantation. And that's a chest x-ray on the left side uh, shortly after transplantation. And, and he left the hospital, and I, well, never saw him again, basically, because I wasn't in the transplant clinic. They've fo he's followed up with them and has been doing quite well. Another chest x-ray, a minor chest x-ray kick, if you will. This is a patient admitted to a, a medical ICU. He's intubated. He's got bilateral, uh, she has bilateral infiltrates um, and um, uh, had acute chest syndrome. A trialysis catheter um, was inserted. And uh, well, uh, it's not supposed to, why that, that catheter is not supposed to go into the lung. Um, they forgot to take out the wire. Um, oops. Now the nurse, on a little bit of probing, we, we asked, well, well, what happened with, with that? You know, did you notice anything was wrong? He said, well, you know, uh, the, you know, the brown port was a little sluggish, come to think of it. And, but I didn't want to say anything, because I didn't think it was important, and I, I just didn't want to talk about it. She noticed that something was wrong, 
But the way that we found out that this was in here is when we actually pulled the catheter out. So what happens when we fail? So 10% of ICU patients experience a potentially preventable adverse event. Initially, we had been shocked when up to 100,000 people were killed annually from healthcare. And in fact, we've discovered that that's a dramatic underestimate. We have way more healthcare associated infections than we should. We failed to also provide evidence based therapies. We were talking earlier today about uh, mechanical ventilation of ARDS patients, and yet there are studies that suggest that 20 to 46 percent of patients actually get this care that, that they should be getting. So, CUSP is an intervention to learn from mistakes and improve safety culture and teamwork. It tries to improve and reinforce good cross-disciplinary communication and teamwork, enhances the coordination of care across the spectrum, addresses overall patient safety. It's not, it is agnostic, if you will, to specific healthcare quality and safety priorities. Um, and it works towards a healthy unit culture. The vision of this is to improve the patient safety awareness and systems thinking on an individual ICU or any unit level, to mobilize staff to say, what can we do, how can we improve, to resolve those patient safety issues that we see every day, and to create a patient safety partnership between frontline providers and executives so that we can actually achieve and execute the change that we need to and that our patients require. We also want to provide and do provide to providers and teams specific tools for them to examine the patient safety issues that exist within the unit. It is helpful, and this is a complex slide that I'm going to just touch on for one reason. On the, the left side is CUSP, and we'll get into that a little bit. It is very helpful when we pair this with a uh, knowledge translation um, uh, uh, mechanism as well. So you can look at overall unit safety, and you can tag it and to central line associated bloodstream infections or ventilator associated events, you name it, those sort of things. So it's helpful to pair those uh, uh, efforts together. At the base of this, or actually at the top of this, is measurement, and then we want to improve. And it's how you go through these processes together. So CUSP involves five steps. It is simple, but not easy. You want to educate staff on the science of safety. That is, how do we standardize the care that we provide? How do we make it easy for us to do what we should be doing? How do we create independent checks for our patients? I was putting in a central line a couple years ago, and, um, and I said, confirmed with the nurse, I said, please stop me if you see me do something wrong. And she said, well, you're Dr. Murphy. Um, you care a lot about central lines, so you're going to be just fine. And I said, please stop. That's what I don't want, because I know I've made mistakes. So please stop me. Please talk. We need these independent checks. And in fact, it is this independent check that actually augments the work that I do. We want to identify defects. And this can come from a number of different sources. It can come from sentinel events. It can come from morbidity and mortality conferences it can come from a, a safety survey, um, as we kind of call it a, 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 in one of the hospitals I work with, the, the shoebox survey. It's two questions. How is the next patient going to be harmed, and what can you do to prevent that? It's really easy. And we just ask everybody who's on the unit. And we use that, and we work as a team to identify what are the next projects that we're going to work on. We assign an executive to adopt a unit, and that's typically a senior VP or above. And this is not a senior executive who, well, the team sends them an email with a little synopsis. This is somebody where we want them to come into the unit, round. We want them to take off the suit jacket, sit down, roll up their sleeves, and work on the issues with us. They are senior executives. They help us to execute. They're trained in that. 
and they also help us to get the resources that we need. One example of that is we had a, a, a COO of a hospital who had been in healthcare for about 30 or 40 years, and he joined our CUSP team, or one of our CUSP teams, and, and I asked him to shadow. Um, we kind of said it, it's a, the undercover boss sort of experience, and, and I asked him for two hours of his time, and he actually gave us a full shift as a patient care tech, and, and cleaning up patients and moving them and, and, and doing a variety of things. He was, by the way, um, chastised by one of the people he was shadowing um, because they didn't know who he was um, because he was wearing his, his, um, his wingtips. And they said, why are you ever wearing those shoes? Um, but, but, but he, at the end of it, said, this is the most meaningful thing I've gotten. I actually understand when a, the front line needs something, I know they really need it, and they need it now. And the front line folks said, you know what? This showed he really got it. This is great. We want to learn from one defect per quarter. It can vary. It can be one defect per month. It depends on the size of the defect, what you need to do. But you want to continuously be learning. And you want to implement teamwork tools. So shadowing is one. A variety of others relate to daily goals and morning briefings and, and some of those that exist in many of, of our ICUs. Maybe not all of them, but there's lots of opportunities for us to improve. So does it make a difference? Well, so this is the report card that the uh, Michigan CEOs in a cohort of hospitals um, asked uh, Peter Pronovos to develop this program uh, to put out. And, and basically, it first asks some things related to central line associated bloodstream infections and, and asks how often did we harm, what's the statewide median of bloodstream infections initially. At the baseline, it was 2.3 per thousand line days. 2006, it went down to zero. How often did we do what we should? And those are the process measures. Did we um, use chlorhexidine, use full barrier precautions, things like that? And initially, it had been 66%. It went up to 95%. Notably, it did not hit 100%. We do need to be careful with how we set our target process measures. Also, how and, and these last two really focus on cost. How often did we learn from mistakes? And we've, we've gone from hundreds, and I apologize for the missing zero, we then went to thousands of times that we have learned from mistakes in our various hospitals. What areas do we need to improve? How do we improve, assess and evaluate our, our patient safety culture? Safety climate and teamwork climate improved from 84 and 82 percent in needing improvement and dropped down to 42, 43%. So some dramatic improvements. Still certainly ways to go, but an improvement. When we translated this from the Michigan cohort of over 100 hospitals, we then brought this to the uh, on the cusp stop BSI. Gabe, is that me or you? It's me. Oh, girl. Make sure I don't forget my phone. Um, so when we translated this across the country to the On the Cusp Stop BSI initiative, we also saw similarly that we saw drops in our collapse rates from a median of 1.2 down to within um, one quarter, down to a median of zero in our participating hospitals. Similarly, we have seen improvements in culture and patient safety. What about the effect of CUSP at Grady? Well, we've looked at central line associated bloodstream infections. We had been a whopping three uh, bloodstream infections per thousand line days. Um, and um, we've dramatically decreased that over time. Within six months, basically having a 60% reduction and a reduction that has been uh, gone down further and has been sustained by implementing this program across um, the ICUs and step-down units at Grady. What about beyond collapse? Well, ventilator-associated events, also we've seen a dramatic decrease within ventilator-associated pneumonias across the state of Michigan. I think one of the, the telling things is also how it relates to overall understanding of what's going on. So this is um, a surgical ICU at Johns Hopkins where um, strikingly they've actually um, 
did highlight that the residents and nurses at baseline pretty had pretty had close to pretty much no clue as to what the daily goals for the patient were. Um, but when they actually started talking explicitly about them, when they cohorted their patients, when they started working effectively together as a team, they had a dramatic improvement, hitting close to 100% understanding of the residents and nurses on what the goals for the patient were. What was the effect? Well, it decreases the average ICU length of stay by about a day. And it also increased the number of new admissions that were able to go through the ICU and generate about $7 million in additional revenue. So there's significant opportunities to improve quality and patient safety across all of our ICUs. CUSP is a tool that can be matched to a number of other approaches and can improve the, the culture and teamwork within our ICUs. It's associated with improvements in a number of different metrics and we're still gaining experience with that, but it is certainly a continuous and ongoing journey. So I thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.